Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. If you break your arm, the cause is apparent, and the symptoms lead directly back to it. But it's not like that with autism. Just look at some of the traits that someone with autism can express. How do you tell if you are autistic, or have some other condition entirely? I am not a doctor, but I do have autism. The way I picture the varied autistic traits is like a constellation of stars. Because the seven brightest stars of Ursa Minor always appear in the sky together, we have given them a name, a classification to separate them from all the other stars in the night sky. But constellations do and don't exist. Looked at from Earth, they certainly seem to. But seen from another point of view, a hitchhiker on the other side of the galaxy perhaps, the grouping might not be visible, or be missing some stars, or have gained a few others. It exists as Ursa Minor, only as a presentation to us, a grouping of stars that tend to go together. For instance, Polaris is 305 light years further away from the next brightest star, Ursa Minor Beta. They're not next to each other at all. I understand the record for hitchhiking 305 light years is just under an hour, but you don't get to see much on the way. The reason we make these groupings is because it is very useful to us. Find a few bright stars in a shape you recognise, and you can more easily find the rest of the constellation, even in conditions that might be less than ideal. Once you recognise Ursa Minor, you can orient yourself to the North Star. And once you've recognised the autism constellation of behaviours, you can name it. To name a thing is to control it, and you can begin to find your way. Everything you see in this video script, links and images are part of a Markdown document available freely on GitHub under a public domain license. Part 1. Detail-Oriented Thinking I know two autism jokes, and I will share them both with you in this video. Are you ready for the first joke? Joke the first. Some say that people with autism take things literally, but they are thinking of kleptomaniacs. I have grown from an autistic child who needed weekly lessons from a childhood psychiatrist in order to learn how to make eye contact into an autistic adult who is flying high in an aeroplane made out of comprehensive coping mechanisms. I am not a doctor, just someone who has tried to understand his condition scientifically and obsessively for many years. I hope explaining what has worked well for me helps others and gives you ideas for things to try. An autistic person has a set of traits we group together under the autism label. Three examples of common non-autistic traits are being left-handed, an introvert, or being more of a visual learner than an auditory learner. Traits are not inherently good or bad, though they might be better or worse suited to some situations than others. More on that later. The way to make sense of this all is to find repeated patterns and groupings of traits, the same as we do for the night sky. There does appear to be a unifying autistic core trait, however, which surprised me. We don't know the biological cause of autism. But the way I think about my condition is that it is caused by detail-oriented thinking. I've heard this sometimes called bottom-up thinking. This contrasts with thinking in abstractions, sometimes called top-down thinking, where high-level concepts are worked out first, details second. The question of what causes autism is uninteresting to me. You can't see my biology, DNA, or chromosomes. What you can see is my behaviour and my presentation. For me, detail-oriented thinking is a proxy for the as-yet-unknown, currently missing, root cause and it is a very useful framework. Autism is extremely common. Between 1 and 2% of children are autistic, and you don't grow out of it. This means that 1 or 2% of adults could be autistic and not know they are. Autism also seems to be extremely heritable. If one or both of your parents are autistic, you might well be too, but the reverse is also likely true. If you are autistic, ask your parents some questions about how they have experienced their life so far. Detail-oriented thinkers value our senses over what we are told, well-defined rules over tacit convention, sticking to a plan over improvisation, and clear data over society's implicit abstractions. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. This is why emotions can sometimes come slower to us. We're paying attention to the million details around us, and sometimes this causes us to miss the big picture. You often can't simply tell us what to do. We'd prefer it if you also tell us the details of what and why from the bottom up. Details first. Contrary to common stereotypes, autistic people are often more aware of the rules of society than non-autistic people. Applying the rules to ourselves can of course be a challenge. Autistic learning is like foreign language learning, I think. We learned the rules more recently than everyone else, we were late to the party. This means that the rules are fresher in our minds, and we work harder to adhere to them so we often get frustrated when we see other people not following them. Autistic people, like mathematicians, want to see how you got to the answer, not just the answer itself. We want people to show their working, or we may not believe them. 
Societal defaults don't come very naturally to us because they don't often come with matching data. Some people are better than other people. This is an extraordinary claim without the extraordinary evidence needed to back it up. The nation I was born in happens to be better than all the others? How convenient. The clothes society says I should wear are decided largely by my biological sex. That doesn't seem very likely and needlessly restrictive. Who cares? Who told you these rules? You cannot persuade me of the simplicity of the world. I can only see the complexity. And herein lies the problem. Neurotypical people can usually choose to employ either detail-oriented thinking or top-down abstract thinking, depending on the task or the situation. Autistic people can't make that choice as easily, and it defines our lives. Talking about common signs of autism is a challenge because there are a lot of pervasive biases built in to how it has been historically defined. All the symptoms in published literature have come from the external point of view of psychiatric professionals or parents or teachers. This is a very different perspective from the actual autistic experience, which stems from detail-oriented thinking. This restricted way of thinking causes the primary autism symptoms of regular difficulties in social interaction and communication, we are lost in the conversation and are missing the social cues around us, restricted or repetitive behaviour, we tend not to look to others for behaviours to imitate, so often reach a local maximum we can't break out of, and resistance to change or restricted interests, The wider world exerts its influence in large abstractions that can be predicted provided you are not focusing on the details. Autistic people focus on the weather. Neurotypical people can better see the climate. These primary behaviours cause wider secondary social effects, including problems in getting or continuing employment or education, difficulties in initiating or sustaining social relationships, and a history of mental health conditions due in part to the conflict between our traits and a society not set up for people like us. These challenges are just as due to our society as they are to our autism. Here's a thought experiment. The idea of ethical consumption is for consumers to try to spend their money in a way where no one gets exploited. But we eventually learned that it is almost impossible in a system designed for value extraction for someone somewhere along the line not to be exploited. An understandable coping mechanism to deal with this world that we find ourselves in is to ignore it. Autism's relationship to society is much like this problem. We want to live our lives in a way that makes us happy, but society is set up with implied rules and conventions that perpetuate themselves not because they make sense, but because that's just how we do things. There is no way to act normally in this system, and for autistic people, this dissonance can be extremely painful, and there is no way to opt out of this system. In addition to the long list I showed earlier, autistic traits present very often alongside ADHD, which complicates diagnosis, as the conditions can sometimes mask each other. See my video on ADHD for more details there. Unlike ADHD, which is not typically considered a disability, autism more often is. The truth is more complex than this binary label, of course. I think it can be any and all of these, depending on the person and the situation. An adult who can't make eye contact is indeed disabled by a society according to the social model of disability. Is it a superpower? Someone with highly specialised interests and tendencies to withdraw from society used to be called a genius, a savant, a brilliant artist. But this definition troubles me, as I think it can minimise the problems people face by focusing on the advantages and utility of the condition. Normally, the utility to your boss, your employment and those around you, not to yourself. If it is a neurodivergence, that just means that it's a normal part of being human. Just as some people are introverts or extroverts, a visual learner or an auditory learner doesn't mean that one is inherently better than the other. And so it follows that autistic thinking isn't inherently better or worse than more neurotypical ways of thinking. This is how I think of autism. Which of these categories you fit into changes from person to person, situation to situation, day to day and hour to hour. But you can help yourself, as I did, by learning about yourself and testing coping mechanisms. Some autistic traits, such as hyperfocus on restricted interest and lack of social aptitude, can be beneficial. Sometimes these traits cause such apparent genius in people that that person is portrayed in film by Benedict Cumberbatch. High praise indeed. Is it autism, though, that causes the apparent genius? Or is it perhaps that regular society has many extremely detrimental norms, and not fitting in, sometimes, is actually a really good idea. It's just me running this channel, and I'm so grateful to everyone for supporting me on this wild adventure. If you'd like to see and give feedback on my videos up to a week early, as well as get Discord perks and even your name in the credits, it would be very kind of you to check my Patreon. I'm also offering a limited number of mentoring slots. 
If you'd like one-to-one tuition on personal organization, Rust, creative production, web tech, or anything that I talk about in my videos, do sign up and let's chat. On to part two. Joke the second. Autism is dramatically overrepresented in STEM fields like biomedical research. This could well mean that autism causes vaccines. Part two, studying the patient. If you are autistic as I am, there are many options you should pursue. Today, I'm going to set out the only one I feel qualified to talk about, studying the patient. Throughout history, we have found that there is exactly one way to learn about the world around us, the scientific method. This is especially important and especially difficult with the mental health effects of autism. Richard Feynman said that science is a way of trying not to fool yourself, and that is what we must undertake. Our perception is unreliable, our memory and recall unreliable, and the stories we tell ourselves and the people around us about ourselves are unreliable. If you are to study the patient, as I recommend, you must find a way to cut through your and society's biases and filters to find ways to cope, or mask, or if you're very lucky, thrive. With autism, you can't set the bone in a cast like you can if you break your arm. It will never heal on its own. You must heal yourself. The friction between our autistic behaviours and society's expectation of our behaviours cause many of the issues we face day to day. There are two ways to ameliorate this. Change yourself, or change society. And while the latter is a very important part of our collective story, others can speak on this topic better than I. I am going to focus on ourselves, the part of the problem that we can more easily influence and take charge of. In my industry, software engineering, when a bug crash or other incident happens, we try to identify the cause and stop it happening again with an incident review. The same principles work for me for figuring out what went wrong with a societal interaction incident due to my autism. Suggesting coping mechanisms before working out what went wrong would be to put the cart before the horse. It would be the wrong thing first. While you may learn about my own coping mechanisms in my pinned video here, and maybe some would help you, it is vital to build a practice of continuous improvement for yourself. You and I only have a little time together. I would rather teach you how to fish than give you a fish. A mental health incident review is an example of applying the scientific method to our own mental health. Observe the incident, hypothesize the cause, come up with a plan that could change the situation next time, and test the plan the next time you're in that situation. You may take many days to finalize the incident review as more thoughts bring triggers and other issues to light. Let's look at a concrete example that all too many people have experienced. We attended a party with friends, everything was looking up, but something ruined the evening for us, and we aren't sure why. We're left asking, why does this keep happening to me? That's a great question, but don't just ask yourself, test yourself. Let's look at the incident report. Why did I have to leave the party? Because I was crying. Why was I crying? Because I was overwhelmed. Why was I overwhelmed? Because it was too loud. Why was it too loud? Because I didn't take a break. Why didn't I take a break? Because I was enjoying myself too much to notice. The five whys section of the incident review lead to one of the possible causes. If this method sounds like a therapist, there's a reason for that. There could be more than five whys in the chain, by the way. The five whys system actually asks as many questions as needed to get to the root cause. We record only the most important five in our review. The five whys I've demoed here may or may not be valid for you or for me, but I hope you can see the utility in drilling down from surface level actions and reactions to the underlying causes. It's also cheaper than a therapist. The results of a clear-headed mental health incident review could give us the data we need over time to build and test new coping mechanisms for the next time we are in a similar challenging situation. In this case, going for a real or pretend smoke break every hour might help, and to stop us forgetting we could set a timer, as it's clear that we can't always remember for ourselves. One of the coping mechanisms that autistic people use, for better and worse, is masking. Masking is suppressing or changing our behaviours to fit in with the perceived norms of those around us, and it's not restricted to autism. Many people mask on a daily basis to fit in with society's understanding of how they should act. For more details, ask any woman. I want to stress at this point that though I'm suggesting tools and techniques to change our behaviour, this is not a moral judgement about our behaviour. The coping mechanisms you discover for yourself are a practical way to cope with wider society so that you can manage each day a little easier. This is also not to say that society's expectations of, say, eye contact or background music in every public place are inherently good, just because we want to have the option to mask or fit in from time to time. Masking, like fashion, helps us fit in when it suits us. Do it for yourself, not for others. If you do it for others, it becomes problematic. We all mask from time to time, such as when we're sad in our personal life but want to remain professional at work. We can mask until the end of the workday. We're advised not to bottle up our emotions, as that can have 
permanent consequences, but autistic people are autistic all of the time, so we must mask all of the time. And while masking should not be required, it is very useful. To make and improve your own, you must study those around you, in addition to studying yourself. Alcohol is a common coping device many autistic people use, though I don't recommend it. The combination of helping you ignore society's expectation of your behaviour, and the fact that if other people around you are drinking too, they might not notice them either, is an understandable combination of desirable factors. But we can, with practice, ignore society's expectations of our behaviour without chemical help. Letting down your guard and being more yourself might mean letting your autistic behaviours out, and that is okay around those you trust, because it can make you happier. Meltdowns affect many autistic people and can be caused by a variety of triggers, but for me, it's always caused by my plans for the future being changed. I used to become furious when my plans were changed, perhaps by weather or a delayed train or someone cancelling. Strangely, I would be furious even when the changed plans benefited me. My coping mechanism here is to breathe. If I can go somewhere quiet for two minutes and not talk to anyone, I can get through it. The primary advice I wish to leave you with is that you are allowed to make space for yourself. Build yourself a first aid kit of physical and mental coping mechanisms. You are allowed to leave the room if it is too noisy, or to wear earplugs or headphones. You are allowed to ask people clarification questions when they do not provide enough detail. And you are allowed to build and test coping mechanisms to fix the gaps that you perceive between where you are now and where you would like to be. You're not just allowed to do these things. If they make your life easier or your days happier, I think you should. And you should start today. I must credit two books which I recommend reading as follow-up to this video and have drawn upon greatly in the research for some of the more technical aspects of autism. Firstly, What I Mean When I Say I'm Autistic by Annie Kotovich. This is an eye-opening account of her self-discovery as one of the many women with autism only diagnosed as an adult. And secondly, Unmasking Autism by Dr. Devon Price. His comprehensive handbook of autism is packed extremely densely with both science and advice. Non-affiliate links to both of these books in the video description. Read them both. Thank you. If you would like to support my channel, get early ad-free and tracking-free videos, VIP Discord access, or one-to-one -one mentoring, head to patreon.com forward slash noboilerplate. I've got a new fiction podcast out called The Phosphine Catalogue. If you like mysteries and art, check it out. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk stories, do listen to my weekly sci-fi podcast, Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, do listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce every full moon called Modem Prometheus. Transcripts and compile checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching, talk to you on Discord.